So welcome to this lecture on cancer pain. It's a huge topic and I don't profess to give you everything you need to know on it. However, this is an introduction to it and there's some important big principles that, are, that um, uh, we, we need to know. Because as pain specialists we will be dealing with a group of these patients sometimes on a regular basis. There's some pain specialists that even have gone into cancer pain management as part of their pain specialty and do this on a daily basis. So it's important and um, the, the, big, um, the big things that need to be understood are a definition of palliative care. Uh, we have to understand the analgesic ladder and how best to use what we've got at our disposal. The assessment of cancer pain, it's important. We know how to assess chronic pain but there might be some differences in assessing cancer pain and so that's important to have a handle on. And then looking at breakthrough pain and bone metastases are the two big subjects when we talk about cancer pain because it happens so often and they are so important. So that's the way we're going to structure the talk. So let's look at palliative care and what is palliative care and I still work with colleagues that think palliative care is end of life, is opioids and is um, turning around and walking away. And it's very frustrating to hear that and I think it's important for us as as pain specialists, as um, anaesthetists, as people that deal with people with pain um, are able to uh, be champions of palliative care and really get the word out there on what palliative care is. So let's have a look at what it is and this is the WHO approach or um, definition of palliative care. And essentially the aim is to improve the quality of life um, of those with life-threatening illnesses. Now that includes patients and their families and I think we've all pretty much get this. But the thing about palliative care is it's non-curative and it's symptom control and those are the two words that I love, is symptom control and that's what pal care doctors do or palliative medicine specialists now do. They are fantastic at symptom control and a whole host of symptoms that patients with cancer always get. So, that, so they're involved in the prevention and relieving of suffering and we'll briefly remind ourselves what suffering is in a little while. The aim is early identification, the aim is impeccable assessment of these patients and the aim is treatment of pain, physical aspects, psychosocial aspects, spiritual aspects and existential aspects and it's the spiritual existential aspects that I certainly didn't get until I spent some time with some of these patients. And what that means is, um, existential almost means a uh, philosophical kind of thinking, so not moral thinking, not scientific thinking, but an other type of thinking, how you relate to yourself. And um, these, are, these, are big, these are big topics. So the WHO defines palliative care in a number of ways. And I'm just going to run through a couple of them. Again, this is a reinforcement. They provide relief from pain and other distressing symptoms. So symptom control and pain is one of the symptoms. We, they they uh, profess affirming living and dying and that's as a, as a normal process. Not to hasten or postpone death and that's not to hasten death which is something that um, healthcare professionals still equate palliative care with is hastening death, which it's not. Integrating psychological and spiritual aspects into the physical aspects. Providing a supportive system to help families live as actively as possible. So it's a support network and process as well. Support system to help families as well, so not only patients but families and to address the needs of patients and families because every patient and family's needs are completely different. Enhancing quality of life, yes. And um, this is applicable early with other therapies that may prolong life. So palliative care doesn't necessarily mean when you get to the end of life um, it's time for palliative care. Palliative care can be involved early on and um, uh, go parallel or happen parallel to other life prolonging therapies or treatments. Palliative care. So this is what the targets of palliative care are on. I've done this to, to again to crystallize our thoughts on what pal care or palliative medicine colleagues do. They deal with current issues, they deal with planning, they deal with end of life stuff and of course they deal with um, uh, issues following the death of a patient. So the current issues they deal with, the main, the main three are 
symptom control, education, and then deal with community and ref uh, the community referral and rehabilitation. So they control symptoms, they educate the patient and their family, and they put in place what is needed. And the symptom control can be in the cancer sufferers or non-cancer sufferers. And the non-cancer sufferers are the HIV AIDS, cardiac failures, lung failures, uh, renal failures, and multiple sclerosis. Those are the big kind of ones that pal palliative medicine gets involved in. And then the symptom controls, pain is a big symptom that's required, that requires control in palliative care. But the other big ones, which I certainly as an anesthetist tend to forget, is fatigue, lack of energy, weakness, and anorexia, cachexia. Those kinds of symptoms are the are big problems for these people, for people living with cancer. So that's the current issues. And then they go on to planning, and then they plan end of life um, uh, processes. And they also plan, are involved in advanced care planning and directives as well. And then they get involved in the end of life aspects of, of cancer or non-cancer um, diseases. And that involves terminal care, whether it be in the hospital, in the hospice, or at home. And I've got palliative sedation there because palliative sedation is required in some patients. Uh, it's something that's not commonly practiced, but it is necessary in some and then following death as well, the palliative care and, uh, teams are involved with bereavement services and support for family and friends. So as you can see, palliative care is not about end of life. It's about a whole number of aspects. And it's important to have a handle on this because if we understand what our colleagues do, it means we can bring them in or we can get them involved in patients that we feel appropriate early on because I must stress to you, they are excellent at symptom control. So the WHO ladder, that came about in the early 80s um, and the ladder was very simple and this was an, an approach to managing cancer pain, a stepwise approach to managing cancer pain. Starting off with non-opioids, simple analgesics. Then moving on to weak opioids, of which the big one is codeine. And then strong opioids, of which the, the one is um, the common, cheap, worldwide uh, one is uh, morphine. So this is the WHO step ladder uh, in the early 80s. It also mentioned that um, medication needs to be given by the clock and adjuvants can be used to control fear and anxiety. And when they started, when this came out, they did a, I think it was a retrospective validation study and they looked at... Um, they looked at pain, and, a, and, a, and a pain was a problem. A large proportion of the patients were taking opioids. A significant amount of the patients had uh, dose uh, had pain reduction. So it seemed to work, although it was a retrospective validation study. Some recently have argued that the WHO ladder may need to change, and the weak opioids may need to um, be taken out of the equation and it might be worthwhile starting with non-opioids, so the simple analgesics, and then moving straight on to the strong opioids. So not really a ladder, almost like a, an elevator, uh, because that seems to be the mainstay of patients' requirements, is that strong opioids. So this was 10 years later, so nine, now 1995, and this was a prospective study. It was a large prospective study, and they looked at um, analgesic use in... Um, in cancer pain relief and they looked at a number of days over the course of the study um, and that was divided and that was um, broken down into a percent really so I'm giving you the percentage over the course of time of the study that um, X Y and Z were used so let's go through it one in, uh, in turn so strong opioids were used 50% of the time according to this prospective study so a huge number 80% or 82% was used by the enteral roots, the orals. 56% was morphine, and the, the other 44% the other was a host of other medication. But morphine, again, the mainstay of medication used. 40%, just under 40% used adjuvants, of which we got antidepressants, anticonvulsants, and steroids. Steroids needs to be in your mind when you're dealing with cancer and cancer pain because it can benefit a number of aspects, not only pain relief, but nausea. Um, it can also improve appetite and give a sense of well-being. 
So anti-neuropathic treatment, 42%, a big number. Um, this was in 1995, I remind you. Nerve blocks, only about 8% required nerve blocks. In the first validation study, the, the proportion of nerve blocks was about 20 or 30%. So what's happening as we're getting better at our um, management of cancer pain, as we're getting better at using a number of um, different kinds of opioids now, we're generally getting on top of pain earlier and less and less people are requiring or cancer sufferers are requiring nerve blocks. However, it definitely still forms a part of your practice if you're a pain specialist. So nerve blocks are important. Um, and one of the other things they found was there was a significant pain relief in the first week of starting um, therapy. So that's important. You get the medication into the patients early. That has pain relief and that probably translates to functional improvements and quality of life improvements. So 76% had good pain relief, satisfactory pain relief in 12%, inadequate in 12%, and that's still a big number. 12% are still getting inadequate pain relief in cancer. It's a huge number. We need to do better. So let's move on. Pain is one of the most feared symptoms in cancer. Uh, and it's one of, the, one of the things that cancer sufferers are so petrified of. And it's important for us to, um, to alleviate those fears. It's important for us to prevent pain. It's important for us to treat pain early and effectively. Um, still, studies today are showing these very scary numbers. Pain, the presence of pain, 33% still after curative treatment. 59% during anti-cancer treatment. So. 60% of patients are still having pain during treatment. 64% of patients are getting pain during advanced metastatic or terminal disease. And f almost 60% at all disease stages have pain. And these, this, this, these numbers are way too high. Um, we're, we're doing it well, but we're not doing it nearly as effective at, as it needs to be. So we need to improve. Now I just wanted to remind you what suffering is, and suffering is a big topic to discuss. But suffering, I like to think of it as a negative cognitive and emotional response. So it's all negative responses following a threat or of damage to um, the physical and psychological integrity of oneself. Now self is a big discussion and we're not going to go there. But things like loss, bereavement, um, uh, financial loss, uh, job loss, all those kinds of things can lead to suffering, of which pain and cancer can lead to suffering as well. But I must stress that pain does not equal suffering and cancer does not mean you're going to suffer. So pain and cancer can cause suffering, but just because you've got them doesn't mean it has to happen. It's confusing, I know, but um, so cancer and pain can cause suffering, but it doesn't mean you need to suffer. So the assessment of cancer pain, we know how to assess chronic pain. Cancer pain is probably the same thing, but there are a number of differences and we need to bear that in mind when, when assessing these patients. Now, from the 1940s, we, we had the TNM classification for malignancy and uh, this allows us to stage malignancy. It's very complicated depending on the malignancy that you're looking at. That allows staging decisions to, uh, that allows treatment decisions to be made that allows prognostic decisions to be made and the TNM classification had improved our approach to cancer assessment diagnosis management phenomenally we don't have such a thing for assessment of cancer pain there is no TNM classification for cancer pain which will improve prognosis which will improve and, and direct treatment so we don't have it and we need it but there are a couple um, oh, well, let me let me go. F let me let me just before I jump forward. Um, so as I said, we haven't got a TNM classification. So uh, uh, the European Palliative Care Research Collaborative um, undertook a large review of assessment tools out there for cancer pain, and they defined a number of domains, and they're the standard domains that we've got: location, function, character, uh, type of pain. They, def they defined six domains, and the sixth one was function, of which um, is, is obviously very important. Now, they, f they did a, so they defined the domains through expert uh, review. They had a look at all the assessment tools out there for cancer pain. 
um, and they found that none of the tools actually had all the domains. So, so their conclusion, and this was recent, was that there is no universally accepted cancer pain um, assessment tool. So again, we don't have a TNM classification. What are we going to do? How are we going to assess these patients? Are we just going to do the standard chronic pain assessment or the standard pain assessment, which may not be extrapolated to cancer pain? It's completely different from cancer pain. So, there are ways of assessing cancer pain, and there are a brief number of tools out there that may be useful and that have been partially validated. I'm just going to run through a few of them. Um, the ISP classification of chronic pain could be used. It is for chronic pain and cancer pain. So we'll briefly mention that. We'll briefly mention the cancer pain prognostic scale, which could be useful. We'll briefly mention the Edmonton staging system for cancer pain. And we'll briefly mention the Alberta Breakthrough Pain Assessment Tool. Now, Alberta is Breakthrough Pain Assessment Tool specifically, so it's not just pain, it's more for breakthrough pain, but it might be useful in the future. So let's go through each one in turn. The ISP classification of chronic pain. Now, hopefully we've all had a look at or got our ISP classification of chronic pain, lovely blue book. Um, flick through it. It's quite hard to read. It's not very user-friendly. However, it did change things when it came out. Now, the classification for chronic pain could be useful in cancer pain. And I just want to briefly mention how it works. There are five uh, axes. The first axis is defined by a number from 0 to 900, and that depends on the region where the pain is coming from. And I think if you've got more than, um, if you've got one or two um, sites of pain, they, they bring about two separate numbers. Whereas if you've got three sites of pain or more, I think the number you score is a 900. So, so it's quite complicated, but it's useful. The axis 2 is uh, defined from 0 to 90, and that's the organ system or systems involved with the pain. Axis 3, 0 to 9, temporal characteristics. Axis 4, point 0 to point 0.9, and that's dependent on the intensity and time um, since onset. And then axis 5 is the etiology, and that's from 0 0.00 to 0 0.09. Um, so as you can see, it's a bit cumbersome. Um, it can be used for chronic pain. Now the thing about the ISP classification of chronic pain is it just provides a list of chronic pain problems. It's not user-friendly. Flick through the book and have a look and see what you think. Uh, it's got no predictive features. It's not like the TNM classification which predicts what we're, what, what's going on and where we need to go. So there are no predictive uh, tools in the ISP classification. And only a few studies have had a look at it with regards to cancer. I just wanted to mention there are also letters that are involved with the ISP classification and each letter provides um, a subsequent um, uh, aspect of this classification. So it's not as easy as you're seeing there. Okay, so the second one is the cancer pain prognostic scale. Four domains. We're looking at worse pain from 0 to 10. We're looking at the emotional well-being of the patient. And I think there is a specific tool to define the emotional well-being of the patient. You're looking at daily, op op daily opioid dosing. So if you've got high opioid doses, you're more likely to have tolerance, possibly difficult to control pain. And then the characteristics of pain. So they, they provide a score from 0 to 17. And a high score means you've got a relatively good prognosis. And this is useful in identifying patients with a poor prognosis. So cancer pain prognostic scale is useful. So we've got some kind of resemblance to the TNM classification, don't we? We can prognose things. This is regarding pain. So the third one, the Edmonton staging system, seven domains. And there you can see the domains. They're quite a bit of overlap with the previous one. Mechanism of pain, characteristics, breakthrough. We know that breakthrough pain is a problem. We'll talk about that in a little while. Previous opioid use, yes. Cognitive function, yes. Psychological distress, yes. Tolerance and past history of abuse. I think it was abuse and psychological problems. So seven, seven domains. It was validated and it, and it provided uh, groups, prognostic groups, good, intermediate and poor prognostic groups. And the Edmonton staging system has, gone, has undergone some changes and I think subsequent studies by the same group removed uh, domains three and four 
and from this they were able to simplify things and provide a good and a poor prognostic group. So just two prognostic groups, good and bad, good and poor. So this is undergoing some changes and it might be useful for assessing cancer pain. So if you look at this you would conclude that those that are young, those that have neuropathic type pain or parts of the pain are neuropathic, have incident pain, so breakthrough incident pain, have psychological problems, have tolerance and a past history of, of, of um, medication abuse, I think it is, um, would score a poor prognosis, which makes sense, doesn't it? But it's important to, to standardize and classify these things. And then the last one, the Alberta Breakthrough Assessment, um, it's still not there. It's, I think it's undergone a number of changes, and it's still early days in this tool. Nevertheless, um, they used a Delphi process, and I think allowed, um, I think allowed a number of sessions by a group of experts, and they came up with 17 questions to assess breakthrough pain. And the assessment, the 17 questions, assesses things like the relationship of the breakthrough pain to uh, baseline pain, the location, the intensity, quality, duration, frequency, predictability, and the response to medication. So we're seeing that things are similar across all um, assessment tools, and um, um, these may be useful in the future. Now, the Alberta scale has got a long way to go still, um, but it might be something that we use in future. It's a research tool, it's quite complicated, and as I said, it needs further validation. So let's move on. Causes of cancer pain. A large study, a large international multi-centered study um, looked at, um, this was by at the IAS, IASP task force, had a look at causes of cancer pain really to see if we can solidify this, and this was in 1999. So they found the pathophysiology of pain to be multi, um, multi-dimensional, come from a number of aspects. 30% of patients had somatic pain, so pain from the covering of the body, joints, um, muscles, uh, musculoskeletal system. 25% had somatic and neuropathic pain. 15% had visceral pain. 10% had somatic and visceral pain and 8% had only neuropathic pain. Now the percentages are not going to add up because you can have two or more types of pain in cancer sufferers. So the, these are the, the, the generators of pain. These are the kinds of cancer that occurred quite commonly following this study. Lung 20%, breast 15%, head and neck 10%, um, and then you've got the GI, the GI cancer, so stomach, pancreas, esophagus, colon, rectum, and then you've got the others, uterus, prostate, and blood. So we'll move on. Now, the study also showed that about 75% of patients had one pain. Breakthrough pain was common, 65%. So two-thirds of patients had breakthrough pain. This is a problem. Um, pain scores were, were scoring high, so they had high intensity. And 90% of patients were on opioids. Now, these are the causes of cancer pain, the characteristics and syndromes. Now, I don't expect you to know this all, but I'm, I mean, I'm giving this to you so you've got an idea about what causes pain. So we've defined what types of pain they were, somatic, visceral, um, no, neuropathic in the previous slide. But these are the causes of the pain now. So the tumor itself is a cause of pain. The tumor treatment or the cancer treatment is a cause of pain. The cancer and general disability of the patients is another cause of pain. And then they could obviously have pain unrelated to their cancer or cancer treatment. So that's where the pain comes from. So the tumor, 98% of the time the tumor can cause cancer pain, and whether that be local or metastatic. The tumor treatments, so the staging, the radiotherapy, the chemotherapy, the operations and post-operative uh, post phase. And then the general disability can cause cancer, can cause pain. And then, of course, people can have pain unrelated. So the, so, the, so the tumor itself generally affects bones and joints, and that's bones, metastatic bone pain, a huge problem in patients. We'll come to that in a bit. And I've given you, um, I've broken that down further for you. Damage to viscera, huge problem, 30% of patients. Soft tissue, 30% of patients, and the nervous system, 30% of patients. And the nervous system, so the tumor locally or, or metastatically invades the nervous system, that's going to lead to plexopathies. 
that's going to lead to peripheral nerve injuries, that's going to lead to radiculopathies called equina syndromes. So damage to the nervous system is a big problem. And then tumor treatment, of course tumor treatment is going to be painful. Up to 20% of causes of the pain in these patients. And that's the tests that the pa various, pa that the various the patients um, go through. So needles in all parts of the body, I'm sure. Um, tubes and, and pipes in all, in all orify of the body. Radiotherapy and chemotherapy, big cause of more morbidity in these patients. And that can cause pain, plexopathy, any kind of inflammation can occur following uh, radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And then, of course, the post-operative. And these patients have big operations. They have thoracotomies. They have mastectomies. And we know that these operations predispose to um, persistent post-operative pain. Then the general disability, the general musculoskeletal inactivity, the general deconditioning, the general weakness and fatigue, the cachexia that comes from um, cancer can lead to general aches and pains. Pressure sores, mucositis is a big one as well. We see a lot of that in our institution. So let's talk about breakthrough pain. And this is something that we have to have a handle on. We have to understand what breakthrough pain is. And I'm going to go through this. And, and the, the problem with breakthrough pain is that no one really is defined on a consensus for breakthrough pain. Um, nevertheless, I've had a look at a number of papers, and this is what I understand breakthrough pain to be. And I think it's a good definition of breakthrough pain. We've got to know this. There's three points to it. Transit exacerbations of moderate to severe pain, so transient exacerbations of moderate to severe pain on a baseline of pain that is moderate to severe, so there's a baseline of pain that is moderate to severe, there are transient exacerbations of pain um, of, of moderate to severe intensity, and this baseline of pain needs to be under reasonable control with opioids. So that's the definition, baseline pain moderate to severe under reasonable control with opiates. So the baseline pain is not a problem, but it's these transient exacerbations of severe pain over and above baseline pain. That is true breakthrough pain. So I have to stress, this is not end of dose pain. This is not problems with background pain. So that's why it's important when we assess patients to define and to tease out breakthrough pain and background pain. And this is not pain that occurs during pain, during titration of medication. So this is once you've been under reasonable control. This is not in the titration phase. Breakthrough pain. Breakthrough pain is acute, so it happens, it takes about five minutes. It's frequent, it happens before or more times a day. It's generally short-lived, so it lasts for less than 30 minutes. Um, and it's severe, so short onset, less than five minutes. Um, duration is less than 30 minutes or so, about 30 minutes four or more times a day and it is severe. Now breakthrough pain can either be incident pain which can be up to 90% of breakthrough pain or spontaneous pain which you cannot predict. Um, now incident pain you also cannot predict in some but incident pain can either be predictable so you've got a trigger I'm about to stand up I know that standing up is going to hurt um, I'm about to, to have some uh, breakthrough pain so perhaps I should medicate myself or I'm about to do X, Y, and Z, it's predictable, I know when it's going to happen. Or of course, it to be unpredictable, well I cannot predict when my bladder is going to have a contraction or a spasm and that's going to lead to pain. Or of course, the breakthrough pain can be completely spontaneous. Now it's quite difficult to tease out the difference between unpredictable incident pain and spontaneous pain, but nevertheless, this is a good approach and understanding to what breakthrough pain is. Now the thing we need to understand is breakthrough pain is associated with suffering. So this is one of the pains that does cause suffering. And, it, and it's associated with a poor prognosis, poor quality of life. Patients will really suffer when they have breakthrough pain. That's where we as specialists need to get involved with our palliative care uh, colleagues because they are really good at managing breakthrough pain. Now the management of breakthrough pain is pretty much like the management of any pain and we know this multidisciplinary, um, multimodal, where we, we're not going to spend too much time on this. But when you're talking about cancer pain, there are a couple of things that need to be stressed. It needs to be individualized. 
you could say that for all patients. It needs to be interdisciplinary, absolutely. So you can't do this as a pain specialist, as an anaesthetist. You need to do this with cancer, cancer teams, so palliative care teams, oncology teams. Communication is vital and all the teams need to talk. Acceptance is a big thing and we need to, um, patients need to be aware of their need to accept pain. And that's part of chronic pain management as well, acceptance therapy. But it's important in cancer pain as well. Patients need to participate, patients need to get involved in their management. You could say that for all kinds of pains. And the analgesia is dependent on the stage of the disease, so you've got to work with the oncologist and pal care docs to define where we are in the disease stage so you can, uh, so you can manage appropriately. If, they're if they are at end of life, well, you're not going to go and do some in invasive procedures. Uh, you're going to want to settle them quickly um, so they can be around their friends and family. Nevertheless, sometimes invasive procedures can be useful in situations. So again, you've got to decide on each patient as an individual with your colleagues. Reassessment is very important in these patients because things change so quickly. They get complications and side effects of cancer and the treatments very quickly. Um, and as I've said, the cancer therapy also depends on the stage of the disease. So the cancer therapy, it might be that if you treat the cancer, you can manage the pain. Just a reminder that there are a number of other things that occur in these patients other than pain. Sometimes pain is not even a problem in some patients. Fatigue, weakness, cachexia, anorexia, constipation, they're on heaps of opioids, shortness of breath, painful swallowing, coughing, jaundice, fever, and the list goes on and on and on. And that's why palliative care physicians are symptom control experts. Remember that. Another reminder that we should be using possibly not the whole WHO ladder, but possibly using an elevator to get from the non-opioids straight on to the strong opioids. Weak opioids don't normally form part of therapy. And again, just a multi-pronged approach to these patients. So you could extrapolate this from the chronic pain um, side of things, deal with the medical side of things, deal with the physical, deal with the functional, deal with the psychosocial and have that education and acceptance as part of therapy. So pharmacological principles of breakthrough pain, so not non-farm principles, farm principles of breakthrough pain, individualized by the mouth, by the clock, by the ladder, and I pay very strict attention to detail. Mouth, clock, ladder, individualize, and detail is very important. It does make sense if you treat the background pain well that the breakthrough pain um, will be less. So breakthrough, uh, sorry, background pain needs to be managed well. Mouth, clock, ladder, individualize and pay that, pay your attention to detail. When is it? Is it end of dose? You know, really understand the pain. Breakthrough pain needs to be, the, so the medication needs to be efficacious, it needs to work, it needs to be potent. Uh, it needs to have a quick onset, it needs to have minimal side effects, and it needs to be easy to use. It's your ideal analgesic. We still haven't found that ideal analgesic, but we're getting close. We're better than we were years, years gone by. So again, reminder, symptomatic control. So control the symptoms, control the, the side effects. And then opioids are the mainstay of pharmacological control of breakthrough pain. Now, I'm not going to run through each one in turn. I'm going to focus on buccal and uh, pharmacological agents, buccal opioids. Just a reminder that inhaled intranasal and sublingual can be used. Now intranasal has a number of problems. I think the device can be quite tricky. Uh, you can only deliver small volumes, so 150 micromoles. It can hurt, it can run off, so it can run down to the back of the throat and get swallowed. Um, and same thing about sublingual. Dry mouth, pruritus, a number of um, uh, disadvantages to using the sublingual approach. However, we're getting there. But buckle seems to be the way that um, is certainly pushed quite a lot at present and it probably is because it has some useful, uh, as a useful way of dealing with breakthrough pain. Now remember we know the breakthrough pain short onset, short offset, severe intensity, so we need to be able to give something that's lipid soluble with a high bioavailability that the onset is quick and the offset is quick as well. So that's why we're aiming for using various routes such as buccal. Because oral 
it's just not going to it's not going to cut it it's not going to cut the management for breakthrough pain by the time you've taken an oral tablet the breakthrough pain's gone by the time it gets into the system so that is not useful so we need to change our approach to managing breakthrough pain again brief reminder that you should be using non opioids you should be using adjuncts you should be using whatever is necessary to treat the pain and other aspects of symptoms as well let's just focus on buccal now so trans oral transmucosal fentanyl citrate it says oral but it's actually buccal that's the first thing these medications are, are uh, marketed only for breakthrough pain they are not to be used in opioid naive patients and they're not marketed for acute pain having said that I have heard that I believe the military um, on the battlefields are using uh, fentanyl uh, as opposed to say intramuscular morphine or with intramuscular morphine so it is used in the acute setting in some situations but it's certainly not the way it's marketed and pushed for I had a note, that I just want to make a note that some studies you look at looking at oral, um, oral transmucosal fentanyl still mention it as sublingual and it's not truly sublingual, it is buccal the way they say you need to apply it. Is, is, um, it's a buccal application. This is just me being pedantic. And the dosing is difficult for um, fentanyl because um, a lot of the studies used open, open, um, open label titration phases beforehand so really quick vast um, initial titrations before the study started now I just wanted to mention the bioavailability 50% bioavailability which is pretty good the dosing the dosing as I said is wide there's a wide range of doses 200 to 1600 micrograms the onset is quick the peak levels are quick as well and that's why it might be useful in breakthrough pain but important respiratory depression is a huge problem these are strong opioids these are dangerous these look like lollipops um, and if gotten into the wrong hands could be could be fatal so um, these shouldn't be treated like the way they look these are dangerous medications fentanyl buccal tablets is also relatively new and similar to oral transmucosal fentanyl breakthrough pain only not to be used in the opioid naive patient and it's not to be used in acute pain and they're a buccal tablets and I think they've got a number of slight advantages over um, the oral transmucosal fentanyl lollipops probably all does the same thing and I know there's big pharma involved in these companies but nevertheless these could be useful so the bioavailability might be slightly higher than the lollipops the dosing is different as well 100 to 400 micrograms and there you can see a possible um, dosing correlation but again we, we all know that to correlate one medication to another medication is very difficult and we need to be very careful when we do that quick onset quick offset and it's stated that maximum of four doses should be used a day again fentanyl buccal tablets look pretty pretty inconsequential tiny little things but respiratory depression is a real risk. These are dangerous medications, so not for opioid naive patients and not in acute pain. Bone metastases, let's spend a bit of time talking about bone metastases. Bones are perfect. Bones are perfect places to give you metastatic bone pain. They have a huge blood supply, so they're perfect for metastases. The metastases get there. And of course the periosteum now we know is, um, is richly innovated and it's ideal to produce bone pain as well. So metastases in bone, perfect for bone pain and debilitating bone pain. Breakthrough pain, difficult to treat. Now I just want to briefly mention um, uh, the cells of bones and the bone lineage cells. So bones start off with um, osteogenic cells, so osteoprogenitor cells, they can um, differentiate into osteocytes or osteoblasts. Now osteoblasts, the B there stands for building. So osteoblasts are responsible for building the bone extracellular matrix as well as the mineralization and matrix or matrix and mineralization of bone. So osteoblasts build bones and they come from osteoprogenic progenitor cells. Osteocytes are mechanosensitive type cells and they're responsible for 
controlling bone metabolism. So they control osteoblasts and they control osteoclasts. Now osteoclasts, as you can see there, are responsible for bro bone breakdown. So bone is being made, bone is being broken down. There's no normally a balance between the two. So osteoclasts break down bone and um, they generally um, derive from probably macrophage um, cell lineage. And as you can see, osteoclasts work by promoting a micro or uh, an acid environment in this in micro little in micro areas around osteoclast becomes very acidic or not very acidic becomes acidic and that is responsible for bone bone resorption bone breakdown so that's the basics of how bone work and that's quite important because we'll get to in a second now bone metastases just a reminder that um, Bone mets come from specific cancers. The big one is prostate, which is not there on the diagram, but remember pro prostate, perhaps draw it in. Uh, breast is a big one. Lung is a big one. Thyroid and kidney are big ones as well. Excuse me. Which bones get metastases? Well, vertebra, it's a big one. Then ribs, then skull then the long bones and then the pelvis and sacrum. Now that's almost all the bones but that's the general way that it occurs. Vertebra, ribs, skull, long bones and then the pelvis. Now the effects of bone metastases, you can get bone pain which we'll come to and that's a particular kind of pain but it's um, pain in the bones related to the metastases. You can also have other things that happen from bone mets, and that's something we need to remember. You can get pathological fractures. The spine can become insta um, yeah, ins unstable. Spinal cord compression can happen, so, so you get collapse of vertebrae, you get spreading out of the bones, and that can in effect lead to foraminal stenosis, central canal stenosis, spinal cord compression, which is one of the palliative care or cancer um, emergencies. You can also get re reduced bone function, so the metastases can itself just lead to bone failure, so anemia, pancytopenia, thrombocytopenia, uh, neutropenia. Um, the reduced bone function, you could also have hypercalcemia as a consequence, and this is one of the common um, symptoms that occur in cancer sufferers. And then hypertrophic osteoarthropathy as well, so painful bone. Uh, you can get clubbing, you can get a periostitis. Um, so that can also occur. But the main one is bone pain, fractures, reduced bone function, and spinal cord compression, of course. So the pathophysiology of bone metastases, so how do they cause what they cause? Well, the tumor itself and the osteoclasts themselves, remember the osteoclasts are the, um, are the ones that cause breakdown and resorption of bone. Um, both tumors and osteoclasts can cause local acidosis and this local acidosis remember is responsible for the bone resorption well this local acidosis and these um, hydrogen, hydrogen ions and acid ions can be responsible for activating in various number of channels transient receptor potential vanilloid channels so TRPV channels can be activated through this local acid environment acid sensing ion channels can be involved and these are important in primary afferent neurons and you see these are important in sensitization of pain and pain sensation. So the acid from the tumors and from the osteoclast can activate um, nociception. Loss of mechanical bone strength is another thing that happens. Um, there is a neuropathic component to the pain that, that, that uh, bone metastasis patients uh, feel and this might actually due directly due to tumor induced injury of bone uh, oh, sorry of um, of uh, neurons uh, sensory fibers or remodeling of sensory fibers that innovate the bone and we know that bone is richly innovated so the tumor themselves can actually uh, cause a direct invasion of these uh, sensory fibers or remodel the sensory fibers and then tumor as a mass itself can just grow out and pinch a nerve Will grow into the spinal cord um, and grow into nerves and that can be another reason why you can get um, pain. So a number of reasons why bone metastases or how bone metastases can cause pain. But the main one is the um, osteoclast and tumor mediated acidosis affecting TRPV and acid sensing ion channels. Treatments of bone metastases there are a number of treatments of bone metastases and I don't want to spend too much time going in through all of them but I do want to briefly mention a few that are important. Radiotherapy, 
Now radiotherapy comes with radioisotopes, comes with brachytherapy. Now these are the ways we can deliver radiotherapy. However, we're going to discuss external beam radiotherapy, briefly mention radioisotopes as well. We're going to talk about bisphosphonates and their treatment for bone met metastatic pain. Briefly just want to mention corticosteroids and that corticosteroids are useful. It doesn't form part of my practice as a pain specialist, however, dealing with cancer, corticosteroids are used very often and they're very useful because not only are they anti-inflammatory and analgesic, but they also promote a sense of well-being. As I've mentioned previously, they're also anti-nausea um, and um, they're pro-appetite uh, or appetite stimulants as well. And then just briefly mention a couple of the fancy and new ones that are coming out and we're seeing papers now. So let's talk about radiotherapy. First line, bone metastases, particularly localized bone metastases, first line radiotherapy, get your radiation oncologists involved. The mechanism of action, well it might reduce the tumor cells, it might reduce the osteoclastic, so the breakdown of the bone, so it might reduce that osteoclastic induced acid environment, and it might increase osteoblastic activity, so bone build up or bone um, um, uh, the building up of bone. Good paper, quite a long time ago, but it just shows you how good radiotherapy is and there's good high quality evidence to support this. 80% of patients had complete or partial pain relief 14 days after radiotherapy, so it works, it's an analgesic. 90% had pain relief at three months and 66% had pain relief at a year. That's superb results. I wish we could get that for chronic pain sufferers. Um, 70% had no recurrent pain and apparently these areas that are irradiated tend not to get more bone metastases and you can also get complete pain relief in breast and prostate. Yeah, you're right. I wish we could have this in chronic pain. These numbers, these are f these are super numbers. Um, but of course, these are different group of group of patients and another another paper out of the Cochrane group defined an NNT of 4.2 for radiotherapy, which is super, and I think that NNT was for 100% pain relief. So radiotherapy must be, f the first thing that comes to your mind if you've got a ca case of cancer with bone metastases. And they've, it's also been shown that single fraction is ef as effective as a multiple fraction radiotherapy. Now the thing about radiotherapy, of course, is um, external beams, oxygen-free radicals, local destruction, um, and this causes inflammation and any type of inflammation you can think of if you pass a beam through that part of the body it's going to get inflammation pneumonitis, mucositis, esophagitis, cystitis, myelitis, you name it if the spinal cord becomes uh, inflamed and that area is around it you can just push them over into spinal cord compression um, the thing about inflammation is it can of course be uh, completely debilitating for patients but generally they do get a, a pain flare following radiotherapy that is easily controlled with anti-inflammatories and, and sometimes steroids. And that normally occurs for a week or two bef um, following radiotherapy. But of course the problem with radiotherapy as I mentioned is you can't just blast the whole body with radiotherapy because of the side effects. So it needs to be targeted to single, to single or isolated or small bone metastases. Now radioisotopes, I just want to mention, it's another way of delivering radiation or radiotherapy. And what these are is radionucleotide agents that are incorporated into the metastases. Now the metastases are osteo, uh, particularly uh, osteoblastic activity. So, so um, radioisotopes are put into the body, um, highly radioactive. They generally get taken up by metabolic activity, the osteoblastic activity, which tends to be high in some uh, tumors such as breast and prostate. Um, they're beta emitting isotopes, they're unpaired electrons and they've got a high uh, kinetic energy or high energy and that causes destruction for a short distance around where, they've, where they're taken up. So they, this radioisotopes can be given to where there's more than one skeletal metastasis, so more than one site. If it was one site or a couple of sites, radiotherapy. Uh, where there's high bone activity and where there's osteoblastic mixed type lesions, as I've mentioned, breast and prostate. I w but again, this is with multiple metastases and you've got to consider radioisotopes. I don't know if it's really well practiced at the moment or well, um, uh, if, if, it's, 
if it's widely practiced, but it looks like it can be something that can be quite useful. These are just examples of radioisotopes, strontium, samarium, rhenium. The older ones were phosphorus 32. Bisphosphonates, second line therapy. Now they're second line therapy because of the side effects that they can they can produce. Uh, symptomatic metastases, and again, only for symptomatic metastases. Why? Because bisphosphonates have side effects. So not everyone with metastases should get bisphosphonates. They pyrophosphonate analog uh, pyrophosphate analogs. They inhibit osteoclastic breakdown activity. They promote osteoblastic building activity. They stabilize bone structure. That might be anti-inflammatory and even antinociceptive as such. Um, and as I've mentioned, when analgesics and radiotherapy are, are inadequate, then you move on to bisphosphonates because of the side effect profile. They reduce skeletal events. They can reduce the hypercalcemia. They can reduce pathological fractures, and they can reduce spinal cord compression. But as I've mentioned, you should be symptomatic before you, you um, are given bisphosphonates. And these are the big side effects. They get acute phase reactions. It can be quite toxic to the kidneys, and osteonecrosis is something we all talk about, particularly in the jaw, and I'm, um, it, it, it can occur, and it can be quite devastating. You've got a bit about osteonecrosis in your reading package. It's good to know a bit about that. Now, there are a couple of new fancy things out there to treat bone metastases because we're now understanding about bone metastases from better animal models of cancer pain and, and um, bone pain. We're now targeting bone metastases, so there's a lot of this fancy stuff going on. So this is a picture that I've shown you. Now, receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa B ligand rank, rank L, Rank L has been shown to affect osteoclastic activity, and that can promote osteoclastic activities, and Rank L is associated with, um, I think, certain tumors. Promoting osteoclastic activity, breakdown of bone, bone problems, um, bone pain. Remember, osteoclastic activity is associated with bone pain. So if we can affect Rank L, we can block Rank L, we could possibly um, reduce osteoclastic-induced bone pain. Now there are some fancy things such as OPG analogs, so osteoprotegrin analogs, such as denosumab, that can inhibit this or change the balance between rank and rank L. So these are newer kinds of treatments out there. And lastly, I just wanted to mention nerve growth factor inhibitors, and gabapentin now has been studied particularly for bone pain and bone metastases. So if you've got somebody with bone metastases, use a gabapentinoid. There's more evidence for, pre, uh, for gabapentin at the moment, but please use it. We know we should be using it. It's safe. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a complicated medication. There's no complex drug interactions, and it can be effective. So bone metastases, as a pain specialist, we need to use um, gabapentin earlier. And this is probably a way we can collaborate with our cancer pain colleagues. They're good at radiotherapy. They're good at bisphosphonates. They're good at symptom control. But we might be good at reminding them that gabapentinoids are out there and can be useful, and possibly even that small percentage of patients that require nerve blocks to try and get them over the line, get them really, get them back to being, um, to enjoying their life or having a quality of life. So that concludes this topic.